agenda that I'm trying to promote for the computing community, the AI community, uh, the trustworthy computing committee, and the formal methods community. So let me begin by, of course, setting the context of the promise of AI um, already achieving or exceeding human performance in recognizing objects in the street, talking to us at home, um, and of course, beating the best human Go player in the world. AI, I believe, can benefit humanity and society uh, in terms of, well, the promise again of self-driving cars to reduce traffic accidents on the road, um, the fact that already uh, computer imaging systems are outperforming uh, human neuroradiologists in terms of detecting whether a, an image is showing a malignant or benign tumor. Um, the hope of uniform treatment uh, of, of um, justice in the criminal justice system. And of course, in the hiring process where um, instead of uh, being subject to human um, biases and so on, there's more uniformity. Now, of course, we do ask the question of why should we trust these AI-based systems? After all, we know just putting some duct tape on a stop sign fools the classifier into thinking it's not a stop sign. Adding noise to a uh, image of a benign tumor can uh, change the classifier into thinking it's malignant. And we all, of course, know about the uproar in terms of risk recidivism, uh, machine learning, uh, or statistical uh, learning systems uh, 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 being potentially biased against Blacks. And we even see headlines where companies know that their recruiting tools that use AI uh, can be biased against women. So the question I wanna ask everyone is, how can we deliver on the promise of the benefits of AI, but address these scenarios that have life critical consequences for people and society? In short, how can we achieve trustworthy AI? And I wanna put into context the term I'm using trustworthy AI, um, uh, uh, because I've been working in the area of trustworthy computing for a couple decades already. And trust, the trustworthy computing community has already come to a consensus on what trustworthiness means. It really means various properties which computer, computer scientists know how to at least define and even make progress in uh, determining whether a computing system has that property or not. So the kinds of properties I'm talking about are reliability, does it do the right thing? Safety, does it do no harm? Security, how vulnerable is the computing system to attack? Privacy, does it protect a person's identity and data? Availability, is the system up when I need to access it? And usability, can a human use it easily? And by a computing system, of course, I mean the hardware and the software components of a computing system, but I also include the people uh, who interact with the system. And for the, for the most part, um, many of these properties are formalizable. We all agree on what these properties uh, mean or some subset, subset, subset of these properties. And we know when we don't have a computing system that satisfies a given property. Well, from trustworthy computing, I purport that trustworthy AI ups the ante um, it, by first adding new properties that we never actually had to think very seriously about or at all in terms of a computing system. So now a computing system is an AI system. It's got some AI component, machine learning model perhaps. Um, it's doing some on, online real-time learning um, and it's affecting the, uh, the environment also possibly in real time and of course affecting the user. And so first there are properties for machine learning that we have to 
think seriously about. And these are, of course, properties like accuracy, how accurate is a cl classifier. But the new ones that I'm really focused on in trustworthy AI are properties like robustness, fairness, accountability, transparency, interpretability, explainability, and even ethical issues. And properties yet to be identified, because after all, I said this is the embarkment of a new research agenda. So to be a little more concrete by what I mean by some of these properties, um, for accuracy, I mean, how well does the AI system do on new unseen data compared to data on which it was trained and tested? For robustness, I mean, how sensitive is the outcome to a change in the input? For fairness, I mean, are the outcomes unbiased? For accountability, who or what is responsible for the outcome? For transparency, is it clear to an external observer how the system's outcome was produced? For interpretability or explainability, can the system's outcome be justified with an explanation that a human can understand and or that is meaningful to the end user? And for ethical issues, was the data collected in an ethical manner? Will the outcome be used in an ethical manner? And so on. So the big question I ask everyone, all of you and the entire computer, computing community, the AI community and so on, is how can we achieve trustworthy AI? Where I, by trustworthiness, I mean all the properties I just enumerated, and by an AI system, I mean beyond just a computing system, but a computing system that has some kind of AI component. And so one approach, and this that I would like to explore with all of you is through formal methods. I'm not saying that this is a silver bullet. All I'm saying is that in fact, we have to um, gather up all our ammunition in terms of what we know how to do to achieve trustworthy computing, um, to achieve trustworthy AI. And we know that formal methods has had great success, uh, not just in academia, but in industry towards um, ensuring computing systems are more trustworthy. I wanna also emphasize that these methods that um, I'm gonna talk about complement existing software engineering methods like testing and simulation. Um, we need those as well. Uh, and I'm really partly speaking directly to the formal methods community to say there's an opportunity for all of us in formal methods to look at these new AI systems with new properties in mind. So let me first walk again in context uh, you through what traditional formal methods would uh, 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 strive for in terms of verifying a system with respect to a property. So in a traditional formal methods or traditional formal verification, we aim to show the expression in the red rectangle uh, is true. And this is red M satisfies P. M stands for a program, it could be a piece of code, or it could be more abstract than a piece of code. For instance, it could be a protocol expressed in terms of a state machine, or it could be an abstract model of a concurrent or distributed system, but it's a formal object. The double term style is borrowed from logic and it stands for the way in which we're going to determine whether a model satisfies a property. So we use formal logics and tools and already the tools like model checkers, theorem provers and satisfiability module theories, SMT solvers, encode the logics and the, and the reasoning um, that is needed to do a verification. And then P of course stands for the property of interest, whether it's a safety property or a liveness property or an availability property or security property. We encode the property of interest in some kind of formal logic and usually it's a discrete Boolean logic. Um, and then it's representing some kind of correctness property. And for over 30 or 40 years, we have come to understand how to characterize these correctness properties for systems, including concurrent and distributed systems into what are called safety and liveness properties. So the expression M satisfies P 
in the trustworthy computing context, in the formal methods context, is very well um, understood. It has shown great success. Um, and there's no controversy as to what it means. Now let's contrast that. Oh, before I go on to contrasting that, there is one other element in this expression that is sometimes stated explicitly, and that is a model of the environment in which the system, say the program, the protocol, um, or the distributed system uh, will operate. Um, and that is expressed explicitly in some uh, set of assumptions or some model of the system environment as E. So now I basically added a new component to the verification challenge, E comma M satisfies P. But everything that is in the red rectangle is a formal object and everything uh, can be for, uh, so that assumes that things can be formalizable and then one uses the logic of the double turn style to show or to prove that the property is correct um, or the property is satisfied by the uh, program or the model M in the context of E. So from traditional formal verification, uh, let me just uh, give you a, a short primer of how that might look in the old days. Um, and this is a model checking primer in one slide. Um, we might want to show that some model M satisfies some property P and we use a black box called a model checker. Um, and there, it has two inputs. One is a finite state machine model M of say the concurrent or distributed system or the cache coherence protocol or um, some synchronization protocol. And the second input is a property P um, say deadlock freedom um, or some correctness uh, property uh, that we want to, to show a of a protocol. And this is expressed in some kind of temporal logic. And basically this black box model checker is push button technology at this point. You push the button and out comes yes. Every single behavior represented by M is satisfied by the desired property P or no, a counter example is produced and that's a state or that behavior that's spit out, um, P is falsified. So one, uh, the model checker produces not just an answer no, but it produces a witness or evidence of why that property doesn't hold of that model P. Um, now, to go from verifying AI systems to verify, to, to go from verifying computing systems using formal verification and, and formal methods, to verifying AI systems, again, we are upping the ante. So on the left is what I showed you before, E comma M satisfies P. On the right, we need to reinterpret M and double turn style and P. So first M now, um, it could be an AI system, but to be interesting, let's focus on that part of the AI system that is the machine learned model. So let M be a machine learned model. Um, now, in the end, don't forget that all these uh, models that we're learning uh, using machines are, well, they're just a piece of code. So this gives me hope that we, we can use these formal methods techniques because we're just analyzing code. Um, the second uh, difference is to reinterpret what double turn style means. So here we have it still means satisfies, but it may be that we have to use uh, novel kinds of logics in order to do the reasoning, in order to do the proofs. Um, so for instance, there, uh, just because we need to deal with real values, we sometimes use techniques like interval analysis. Um, and for sure, we're going to need to lean on probabilistic logics. Um, and I'll give you a couple of, of, of examples of that shortly. And then P is the property of interest. And these also may very likely be expressed in terms of some kind of probabilistic logic or um, have, to, uh, have to deal with stochastic processes. Um, these are uh, unusual kinds of properties for the formal methods community to have to work with. So um, the other big difference between say, verifying a computing system and verifying a machine learned model 
is the role of D, role of data. And so analogous to the model of the environment in which we um, are trying to show that some um, program or abstract model is correct with, res with respect to P, we may also need to model the data um, in which we either test and train the model M or more interestingly, deploy it in practice. So you can think of the model of data as perhaps being a stochastic process or distribution that generates the data inputs on which M's outputs need to be verified. This is actually going to be a specification challenge, something that, again, would be quite novel for the formal methods community to address. So this is the nutshell of what I mean by using formal methods uh, to show AI systems to be trustworthy. And now what I want to do is walk through each element uh, to argue what new research questions have to be answered in order to um, tackle this particular expression. So let me just uh, state again, two main differences for DM satisfies P is one is the inherent need for probabilistic reasoning. Um, and the second is this interesting new role of data uh, in terms of how it plays into the verification process. So let me just say a little bit more about probabilistic reasoning. Um, M is semantically and structurally different from a typical computer program. It's inherently probabilistic. If you think about a, a deep learning model, the edges on, on the, in the DNN are, are probabilities are, that are running around in the system. This is something that you typically don't see in a computing system that's a deterministic state machine. So internally, the model itself operates over probabilities and, and likely it outputs results with assigned probabilities. So a classifier uh, uh, will, uh, will say, yes, it's a dog with some high uh, probability or no, it's not a dog with some say low probability. Uh, structurally, M is machine generated. And this is quite important. The kinds of programs that we have, we're, we're used to say analyzing or verifying in the past are our programs that are pretty much, you know, at some level written by a human being. Um, but now we're generating code from a machine. Um, and so I like to think of this almost as another kind of intermediate code. Again, I think this is a great opportunity for the programming language community who, who do work and and static and dynamic analyses to think about this as a new kind of artifact in which to do a reasoning. So, and then finally, of course, we need to reason about the uncertainty of M's environment, which is uncertainty in any, um, for any model, uh, you know, in, in computing is typically represented in terms of probabilities. Okay, and the other need for reasoning about, uh, for need for probabilistic reasoning is that P itself, of course, may be formulated over continuous, not just discrete domains, and or using expressions from probability and statistics. So for instance, robustness properties for DNNs are characterized as predicates over continuous variables. Fairness properties are characterized in terms of expectations with respect to a loss function over reals. And differential privacy, which is one of the few formalizations of privacy, is defined in terms of a difference in probabilities with respect to a small real value. So we can't avoid um, these continuous variables uh, reasoning over reals. We can, of course, do approximations. But in the end, we are um, uh, uh, reasoning over these um, continuous variables. And then finally, the logics, um, as I mentioned already, will likely need to borrow a lot from probabilistic logics and hybrid logics. Um, and I think we, uh, fortunately, in the formal methods community, have been working on both of these kinds of logics for, again, a few decades. And now they may be quite relevant for verifying AI systems. However, um, they all need to be scalable, scaled up, 
Um, and we're going to need new techniques to work over reals and nonlinear functions like ReLUs um, and probability distributions, stochastic processes, and so on. So here's an example, and this just goes to show you how long the formal methods community has been working in this area on just hybrid logics and hybrid models. This is Hensinger's, Tom Hensinger's 1996 thesis. Um, and this basically goes to show how one can represent a computing system. Here's a thermostat, very simple thermostat um, in terms of hybrid automata. And hybrid automata has in uh, the states a set of differential equations. So we're really reasoning about continuous behavior within a state. And then the transitions are uh, discrete. So when the thermostat um, goes below a certain temperature, then we go from on to off um, or off to on uh, when it goes above a certain temperature. And then we can express invariance in, within the state and also across the entire automata. So this is pretty um, well known and understood in terms of reasoning about uh, reals and discretes at the same time. A completely different approach for reasoning about uh, the continuous and discrete at the same time is to within a single logic, uh, and this is a logic called differential dynamic logic, um, invented by a former colleague of mine at uh, CMU, Andre Platzer, um, where in one single logic, one can express both continuous and discrete behavior um, in a program. So this is a simple programming language. And also um, reason about um, discrete and continuous behavior in terms of the logic, the formula that one might write in for expressing some property P. Um, and so this is what's nice about this is you don't have to learn multiple languages or multiple proof systems. You can do everything in, a, in one logical system. Um, and this is logic has been used to reason about um, cyber physical systems where you have to worry about say cars that are driving on a road or airplanes that are flying in the sky, um, those are continuous um, systems, um, but there are discrete, there's discrete behavior like uh, avoiding a collision, you have to turn right right away. And then another area <coughs> I wanted to mention in terms of reasoning about uncertainty is on probabilistic programming. So I've talked about auto probabilistic automata and logics and so on, but there's actually a small number of probabilistic programming languages that people have proposed. And one of them called STAN is actually used quite heavily in the statistics community. The one I'm showing here looks C-like, so that's why I'm showing it to this audience. And the idea is that the variables like C1 and C2 here are drawn from probability distributions. And then in this particular case, the observed uh, function uh, chooses one of um, the values. Now, let me speak about the role of data, D. This is actually quite um, interesting uh, and novel to the formal verification community. I wanna start by um, distinguishing between available data, data at hand, which is used for training and testing, and unseen data, data over which the model M is expected to operate without having seen it before. By definition, uh, it's unseen. But the whole idea of using machine learning is to have a model M that can operate over data it's never seen before. So first, there's, of course, the obvious issues of collecting and partitioning the data. How do we partition an available given data set into a training set and a test set? And what guarantees can we make of this partition with respect to a desired property P in building a model M? This is a pretty well known problem in the machine learning community. And it's of course, great interest to uh, people who are collecting data and, and need to build these models. How much data suffices to build a model M for a given property P? Does adding more data to train or test a, a model and make it more robust, fairer, et cetera, or does it not have an effect at all? Um, does adding more data help? 
and what new kind of data needs to be collected if a desired property doesn't hold. So the, here the issue is, suppose I show uh, that the model is not fair or not robust in some way. Uh, do I need to go back and collect more data D, uh, and add it to my set D? What, what kind of data should I add? Now here's the part which I think is really um, a very challenging question in terms of formal methods. And this is the question of specifying unseen data. So let me walk you through the issues. First, the question is how do we specify the data and or characterize the properties of the data D? We could specify D as a stochastic process or data distribution, as I mentioned earlier, uh, for instance, through a the parameters of a well-known data distribution, like a, norm, a normal distribution. Um, we could use probabilistic programming languages, for example, STAN, which I mentioned already, which is heavily used in the statistics community and to specify statistical models. Um, but the rub is, what are the large real-world data sets that we actually collect on a routine basis what if they don't fit common statistical models? Or, of course, what we all know is what, what happens when they have thousands of parameters. Um, so this is a challenge of scale, um, but it's a, real, it's a real challenge. Now, there is another issue that always seems to um, come up when one is doing formal methods generally, and that is uh, how do we break the following circular reasoning. So to specify unseen data, we need to make certain assumptions about the unseen data. So would those some assumptions not then be the very same assumptions we would make to build the model M in the first place? So now how do we trust the specification of D? The whole idea is we're trying to tr trust um, for we have to trust the specification of M, the specification of P, of course. Um, but now I threw in this new variable D and I need to specify D. And the point is in specifying M, I'm implicitly specifying assumptions about the data used to train and test M and also the data on which M is going to be used. And therefore I'm capturing some assumptions in the specification of D. And, but aren't they the very same assumptions that I would uh, be implicitly stating in the specification of M? That's the circularity. So what, what can we do? Well, there are some, a couple of approaches. Um, by the way, this is all research. This is all research questions. I don't have answers to these. Um, and the first is, well, we use alternative techniques, for instance, from statistics. Um, and there's a repertoire of statistical tools that can tell us you know, whether our specification of D is good or, or not, and gives us a way to check it for certain properties and to judge it uh, for goodness. Another approach is um, inspired by how we do things in the formal methods community for um, verifying, say, concurrent or distributed systems, uh, which can be very complex and whose environment might be very complex to specify. We assume that an initial specification is small or simple enough so that it can be checked, say, by manual inspection. Um, and then we use that specific specification to bootstrap an iterative refinement process uh, and build up a richer specification for D. This process is akin to the counterexample guided abstraction refinement process, uh, very commonly used in formal methods. And finally, we have the question of how does the specification of D, including the specification of unseen data, relate to the specification of the data on which M was trained and tested? Um, now, here's another really interesting question um, that arises when, think, when one thinks about the differences between using formal methods as we know them and using them for verifying AI systems. And this is the um, more fundamental question of what are we quantifying over? So in traditional formal methods, we strive to prove for all x, p of x. In other words, once and for all, we do a proof of some property for all input values for x or for all behaviors of that 
system that we're modeling M. And if we can show for all XP of X, then we know for sure that that system will behave on any input value that we throw at it in the real world, um, whether we uh, use that input value as a test value or not. That's the beauty of verification. Similarly, if we show for all XP of X for every single behavior represented by, say, a state machine of a concurrent uh, model of a concurrent system, then we know for any possible behavior of that concurrent system, that property will hold. So for instance, if we want to show some protocol is deadlock free, we model that the protocol, we specify deadlock, the deadlock freedom property, we do the proof, and we know that regardless of where um, we put that that protocol um, in, in implementation in the system, we will assure the entire system will be deadlock free. That's a very strong guarantee. And it would be beautiful if we could make such strong guarantees for AI systems. But in fact, for AI systems, we do not expect M to work for all input data or for all data sets D. That is too high an expectation. And it's not how these AI systems are expected to be used in practice. Now I'm hedging a bit because it would be really nice if we could have a for all XP of X property, a guarantee of an AI system. But I, I just think it's it may be uh, too, too, I don't, wouldn't say impossible. I, uh, there are always you know corner cases where things are possible. But in general, I, I suspect this is not the way to, to try to uh, go for, for using formal methods and verification for AI systems. So what do we quantify over? How can we specify the class of distributions over which P should hold for a given M? And this, the answer to this actually might be property dependent. So for instance, for robustness in the adversarial machine learning setting, we might want to show that M is robust to all norm bounded perturbations D. That's a very well-defined class of distributions. Um, and then we might be able to show once and for all, for all norm bounded perturbations D, M satisfies some robustness property. More interestingly, we might want to show that M is robust to all semantic or structural perturbations for the task at hand. So for example, computer vision. Um, in this case, we're really just showing you add some noise. And, well, here we're showing you add noise in the the classifier is not robust at all, um, uh, uh, misclassifying a panda to be a given. Um, but what we could imagine is a computer vision system operating in our self-driving car um, and, and say and the car would detect that the car in front of it is still a car, even though it might have a dent in, in, in the bumper. Um, and maybe a less robust computer vision system would not realize that a dent in the bumper to a car is a, an acceptable semantic perturbation to the car, the image of a car. Um, and in, in this light, uh, some colleagues and I have been working on this issue of um, making, uh, looking at fairness and looking at fairness in the context of robustness. So not surprisingly, we looked at the Compass data set as a inspiration. Um, and what we showed is that the off the shelf fair classifiers are hardly robust. What we did was we wanted to show that the machine learning model is fair on a given data set. Um, but what we were able to show is that by very slightly reweighting the, the um, distributions, those are the the ones in red, um, we can turn a fair classifier into an unfair one. So in other words, these fair classifiers are brittle. And that's not very good because you go through a lot of trouble to build a classifier that's fair. You actually want it to work on not just the, the, the distribution you trained it on, but other distributions. So how can we achieve that? What we did was we used an online, we adapted an online algorithm, which is essentially a two player game to build a fair classifier that is robust to a class of distributions. Um, and so we use the two players to, um, uh, to play against each other 
One is trying to ensure that the classifier is fair and the other is trying to break it. And over some number of iterations, we can converge to a robust and fair classifier. Um, and so we showed that um, using four different data sets, the adult data set communities, the law school and compass, um, that we can build robust fair classifiers. So here is the robust fair classifiers are the, the, the lowest line in kind of the pink red. So lower the better and flatter the better. Um, and so we show how we do better than um, classifiers that are, are uh, not um, robust and fair. Um, let me turn now to the verification task and ask similar research questions. How do we check that the available data for desired, how do we check the available data for desired property? So we have avail the data available to us and wouldn't it be nice if we could just make a check on it for whether it's fair or not. Um, if we detect that the property doesn't hold, how do we fix the model or amend the property? Or as I mentioned earlier, decide what new data to collect for retraining the model. And then what is the equivalent of a counterexample in the verification of a machine learned model and how do we use it? Um, how do we exploit the explicit specification of unseen data to aid in the verification task? Um, and how can then we extend standard verification techniques to operate over data distributions, perhaps taking advantage of the ways in which we formally specify unseen data? Here, the idea is this. Um, there are um, state-of-the-art interval analysis techniques that are being used to show safety properties of DNNs. Um, and uh, they can reason over intervals. So it's a, a very sophisticated interval arithmetic that one propagates um, uh, the analysis through, uh, say, a DNN. Um, but we want to actually uh, operate over not just intervals you know, uh, 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 over the reals, but we actually want to operate over data distributions so that we have, um, uh, so that we can claim not just that this works for the single distribution, or, uh, but that it works for a class of distributions, much in the spirit of showing how we did robust fairness. Um, there are other opportunities for the formal methods community. Um, one can take into consideration the task, um, and that often constrains the problem um, to help us uh, um, reduce the search space. Um, a completely different approach is rather than do post facto verification, one can build the machine learned model to be co correct by construction. And I'm going to show you an example of, of what I mean by that in a second. Um, the verification community has always aimed for compositionality. Um, methods need to be compositional. The proof techniques have to be compositional. The proofs have to be compositional. And this gives us um, scalability and modularity uh, and so on. And finally, I alluded to earlier, uh, statistical methods for doing uh, model evaluation and model checking. So these techniques like sensitivity analysis, prediction scoring, predictive checking, residual analysis, and model criticism are all standard practices in the statistics, statistical community. And maybe we can learn from the, these methods in uh, determining, for instance, how is our specification of unseen data uh, good or not? So here's an example of robust by construction. Um, it actually addresses this similar problem of uh, uh, DNNs being um, brittle in that you can just, you know, add, add duct tape to a stop sign and the classifier will say it's a yield sign. And so what they, uh, this group of people, my colleagues here at Columbia did, was inspired by the notion of differential privacy where you add noise. Um, what they do is they figure out um, that if you add a layer of noise into the DNN, then you can actually um, guarantee some robustness of the output. So the, the output will, will always give you the right label within some guarantee, within some range. Um, and what's nice about this is that you can control that layer of noise. 
you can, first of all, you can insert the noise layer anywhere, but they found that inserting it after the first layer is the most effective. And you can control the degree of noise to control the degree of robustness that you want. I think this is a quite clever and it's an example of how one should, can um, do uh, robustness by construction. So I will end there and just say that this is the expression DM satisfies P that is what I mean by when trustworthy AI meets formal methods. So thank you very much. I'll stop sharing.